Well, this week on Behind the Headlines, we're going to take a look at two education issues that came to the fore this week. Uh, one is elementary math curriculum, which the school board looked at, and the second is Castilea's plan to expand and how the neighbors feel about that. Uh, so, Elena, why don't you catch us up on uh, the school board meeting on Tuesday and where we're at in this process of adap adopting a new math curriculum. Sure. So, um, the school board discussed on Tuesday night um, this process has been going on for the last year to select new Common Core Align math curriculum for the elementary schools. Teachers um, spent the, the last school year testing out um, different curricula. They could choose from eight that were selected by some math leads at the schools and then um, a committee of mostly teachers and a few parents recommended three curricula um, which came to the board Tuesday night, uh, not for action or anything but just discussion, but really their discussion didn't even get to the content of this curricula. It was more about the process. Um, board members and some parents expressed concerns that parents weren't involved early enough in the process. Um, teachers were exploring and testing out these curricula over the course of the year. And parents were surveyed in February, and then a few parents were brought on to the committee in April and May, which some felt like was pretty late in this uh, process to be, to be bringing parents in. Mm -hmm. Just hearing from Max McGee about this process, he laid it out as if it were very straightforward. So was he or were the board members in any way surprised by um, this pushback or this idea that maybe we're not ready for the pilot after all? I mean, I think they shouldn't have been surprised. The last time the board discussed this in January, the issue was also brought up. Everyone is um, really conscious of this issue with math because the last time um, a new textbook was adopted um, in 2009, uh, there was a lot of uproar around it. This was everyday math, um, and I wasn't around for that, so I don't know if either of you want to weigh in on uh -huh. what that was about, but people, board members were on the board at the time, and parents were involved yeah. are definitely still very aware of how that played out and worry that that's going to happen again with this new adoption. It's somewhat surprising, may maybe, that math, of all subjects, gets a lot of attention um, from the parent community, mm -hmm. um, as well as the teachers and, and, and the school board. Um, I do remember in 2009, um, everyday math was selected without this exploration year. Right. Um, Which is something that they argued they were doing better this year by t slowing it down, taking a full year to explore, right. and not just jumping into a pilot. Yeah, there was a committee of 38 uh, members in 2009, and mostly teachers, but also, I guess, parents mm -hmm. were part of it. And they just pretty much came forward and said, we're going to do everyday math. And mm -hmm. there was a petition, right? Yeah. Um, of some 700 parents who. Yeah did not like it because they thought it was teaching more uh, the concepts of math without the practical um, skill building um, mm -hmm. that they were used to and that they were um, wanting. And what's interesting also, um, so Everyday Bath has been this, the mm -hmm. primary textbook series that uh, elementary teachers are supposed to use, but the district did a survey of um, elementary teachers mm -hmm. this year and found that 40% of teachers are not using everyday math as their primary materials in their okay. classroom, so they've been supplementing it with other um, curricula. Which, yeah. And then also, everyday math is one of the three curricula that this new committee recommended mm -hmm. being piloted next year. Okay. So I think the newer version. The newer version, yeah. yeah. It's EDM 3 versus EDM 4, but there was no real explanation of what's different in the new version. If so many teachers are not using it, why would it be recommended? Right. Some board members asked for more information around that because that seems to be sort of a, a gap between what's yeah. going on in the classrooms and what this group is recommending. Yeah. I mean, it's 2016, and 2009 was seven years ago. So, I, and, and there's been some touch points in between 2009 and 2016 mm -hmm. just to like keep going on um, vetting everyday math and how's the curriculum doing. I know that there was in 2010, um, there was a survey uh, immediately after, yeah, and just to see how. I mean, I don't know how long you want to test out a curriculum to see if it's actually working or mm -hmm. not. But they were uh, the district was concerned about whether or not everyday math was being uh, effective. So one of the things that came out of that that I thought was interesting was so 55% of the teachers surveyed um, who responded to the survey mm -hmm. said that everyday math was actually better than the prior curriculum. Mm. But one of the factors that the parents were concerned about, which was um, are parents going to be um, taking their students and then having them get tutored on the outside? Yeah. You know, kind of skewing the, the effectiveness, um, the measure of effectiveness. Hmm. Uh, and at that time, 2010, they found that um, 
there wasn't any great change in the number of parents you know, sending out their kids for tutoring. But I think that issue has come up again. Yeah. Um, and from my impression of uh, the parent community, there are a lot of people who are getting supplementary. Oh, I'm sure. You yeah. Know, um, tutoring, whether in math or, or the other um, subjects as well. Yeah. What's interesting to me about this is that what you mentioned the 2009 um, process, and um, none of the leadership of this school district. Uh, the administrative leadership was here in mm -hmm. 2009. Mm -hmm. So we have had a complete turnover from the superintendent on down, uh, including most of the principals. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a whole new cast of characters, except there are, I guess, three members of the school board that were, were here back in 2009. And it's amazing to me how we're repeating um, sort of history mm -hmm. here that the big complaint back in 2009 uh, was from the parents who basically said, we don't, and in essence, they were saying, we don't trust what the teachers have concluded here about how to teach math to our kids. And um, the district's response to that was, we, the administrative response was, we're going to defend our teachers and we're going to push through what the teachers want in the everyday math um, curricula. Um, and the school board split, which it rarely it's does, right. three to two in yeah. adopting that uh, curricula in the midst of a lot of controversy. Well, here we've just gone through the exact same thing where the administrators and the teachers uh, have really seemed to have wanted to keep the parents out of this process until they, they do mm -hmm. their work and mm -hmm. come up with at least the top three. Yeah. Um, and so what the board members... What I heard them saying on Tuesday, with the possible exception of Ken Dauber, who struck me as, as just not feeling that this was that important an issue, but the others were pretty um, almost incensed that there had been so little parent input when yeah. they had made so clear that that was important to them as a board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they really, and they talked about this also at their retreat uh, two weeks ago. Um, and they went over sort of the process and what had, had happened. And it seems like even on Tuesday, they were still they were still unclear about what the process should have been like and what what how, how teachers and administrators felt like they were supposed to handle parent involvement, even if it was just this exploration year versus the pilot. Um, so still some sort of unanswered questions that remained. I felt like at the end of the meeting. Yeah, and I think there's. Um, I mean, what we, we we can't see is what's going on behind the scenes, but it strikes me that there's some basic tension here between the board and and Superintendent McGee, um, where uh, he's pursuing his own view of how to go about this process, and the board feels that they've given him clear direction in a different for a different process that he's simply not following right now. Yeah. Well, it seems like a real clash of philosophies. Like, well, who gets to choose? Yeah. You know what the curriculum is going to be? How yeah. much parent input should there be? Yeah. Um, Camille Townsend uh, pointed to administrative regulation that she was. Uh, focused on that had the language of um, from the very beginning mm -hmm. of the selection process. Parents should be involved. Parents should be part of the collaboration. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we at the beginning, you know, when you do right. the pilot, or are we at the beginning when you do the even selection process of the eight yeah. uh, curricula that were going to be vetted, that were vetted in this past year? Yeah, I think that's what staff was arguing. They said, you know, mm -hmm. Whether, I mean, it is hard to tell what's going on behind the scenes, but they said, you know, we thought this was just a year for the classrooms and the teachers to mm -hmm. test these out. Um, mm -hmm. And once we got to the pilot, we had a full intention of, you know, doing robust community engagement. Um, yeah. So, yeah. One uh, of the parents, um, Steve Schmidt, uh, said that. That's that, exactly what I was going to go yeah, through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> said that um, the parent involvement, since he was one of the six on the committee, really wasn't that intensive. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of shocked. He got up and said, um, this really wasn't as scientific or systematic as you might think, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of, I thought, worrisome, <laughs> saying that we right. have these three curriculum, but we didn't really do much except look at which three the teachers had used the most, uh -huh. um, which also might have been influenced by what teachers had already been supplementing everyday math with over the past however many years. Mm -hmm. um, so he was sort of saying, don't take this as seriously as you might be yeah. taking it. And they'd only had two meetings with the parents. 
Um, so it seems like that process really wasn't what it should have been. They were kind of learning meetings, too. Right, weren't yeah. They? Just filling the parents in on what's been happening. Yeah. Well, and I think what the, the effect, I mean, I thought Schmidt's comments were really insightful in that they revealed sort of what, what had gotten us to this point. And the parent involvement really didn't have any impact whatsoever, as far as I can tell. That basically they were they were briefed on what the teachers had concluded. And what was significant, as you say, about his comments was that it appears that the whole process from the beginning of taking these eight different um, approaches and having the teachers uh, try them out really was not structured. It was not put together with a intent of fairly evaluating all eight. It was left to happenstance as to what teachers wanted to grab that curricula and give it a try. Yeah, and Stephen Schmidt said that too. You know, there was one teacher who loved one uh, textbook series, that, oh, but oh, she'd been the only one who tried it out. So there was so no way they could So it wasn't moved forward, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. th that just, I mean, as, a, as an ignorant observer um, that knows nothing about elementary <laughs> school math curriculum, it just doesn't seem like a good process, and I think that's what Townsend mm -hmm. and others on the board were feeling, that, mm -hmm. you know, we can't even get to the substance of the differences of these programs because it just doesn't seem like this was mm -hmm. well done up until this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. I saw um, some evaluation sheets that I guess the teachers were supposed to fill out, um, and it kind of, it just, it was broad, but it said, you know, how well does this curriculum um, satisfy kind of conceptual teaching, how, did you see that as well? Then, then there was the practical skill building, how easy was it for parents, uh, for teachers to use, mm -hmm. and then there was a final category. And I'm kind of wondering if that is going to factor in or has factored in already um, with just the uh, evaluation of the exploration phase. I mean, presumably this data is available mm -hmm. uh, because presumably the teachers have filled it out in yeah. order to get to some point of, uh, unless they weren't, unless that information is not out there. And, really the determination of the top three, which is Eureka Math, Everyday Math 4, and Investigations, mm -hmm. was drawn simply on um, who's using what, and you yeah. know, just a poll, a simple poll. Yeah, um, I, haven't, I haven't seen that. I didn't see that evaluation page, but mm -hmm. I would hope that things like that would be available. Um, and I think the board sort of expressed that too. So Mary Pat O'Connor, who's the uh, principal of Nixon, gave this presentation um, mm -hmm. on Tuesday night. And she, she was sort of explaining the process that her own uh, teachers went through at Nixon um, throughout the year. And the board said, well, I think Camille Townsend said, um, where would we, or how would we have known this? Although, you know, this is the first we're hearing about this mm -hmm. process. So if we don't have this information about what you guys are doing at the sites, it's hard for us to make the decision that we're supposed to. Yeah. Yeah, and drilling down a little bit on that. So there were, let's talk about who was involved and what exactly they did this past year. There were math leads at mm -hmm. each school. There's math TOSAs, mm -hmm. teachers on special assignment. There were individual teachers who were participating. Mm -hmm. I believe there were like less, like 70% of teachers. Yeah, I think so. Right? Yeah, so the math leads mm -hmm. that started last fall went to the County Office of Education and looked at all these new Common Core aligned curricula. They chose eight to bring back to the district and then sort of pushed it out to all the schools, and teachers weren't, they didn't have to test the, the curriculum out this year, mm -hmm. um, so not all of them did, as you just said. Um, and then from that, the eight was narrowed down to the three that were recommended this week. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any idea who who constructed this process? I mean, Barbara Harris, who's the chief academic officer for elementary education, seems to be the point person on staff. Um, from what I can tell, and then sort of the math leads at all the schools were pretty heavily involved. Mm -hmm. I was also interested that, um, so there were six parents on the committee, but there were 30 who applied to yeah. be on the committee, um, yet again showing the interest in math. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't even certain that when the secondary schools committee was convened that they had that much interest mm -hmm. in, by people who were interested in serving on that. So math really touches, um, yeah. maybe it's because we're in tech, tech oriented Silicon Valley, I'm not sure. People have a lot of yeah. experience and uh, interest in, in math and engineering. I wanted um, to mention another issue mm -hmm. that was raised on Tuesday night was whether or not these three recommended curricula are actually aligned to the Common right. Core. Um, there's this uh, nonprofit called Ed Reports that um, they're very well established. Um, if they're backed by um, the Gates Foundation and other organizations. They've been going through and reviewing all these new Common Core tech aligned supposedly textbook series and issuing these really in-depth reports that are all 
publicly available online. Right. Um, and out of the three that were recommended, only one meets expectations for the Common Core standards, according to Ed reports. Hmm. So um, it's really interesting. And you can go through and it breaks down by sort of skills and grade level and, and ranks the different curricula. And um, so everyday math and I think Eureka, um, or Eureka got the highest rankings. And then everyday math and investigations got pretty poor ranking. So wow. some people were wondering what did the staff or people who recommended this even look at these issues or how did they yeah. evaluate the alignment with Common Core and were concerned about that. Yeah. Well, that's a good is, question. As I understand it, there's been a fundamental change in the way textbook adoption occurs in California. Yeah. And maybe mm -hmm. you can confirm what I what my understanding is. But this is the first time we've gone through a textbook, a, an adoption process that the state hasn't um, basically control. Yes. Um, in the past, what's happened is that the state decides what um, curriculum options are going to be available to local districts, and then they can choose one of those, one of several different options, mm -hmm. and, and use those textbooks. This year, and I assume it's part of the whole Common Core mm -hmm. education reform process, the state has, has, has not done that, and now school districts throughout California mm -hmm. are free to make any adoption they want to. And yeah. that's created, obviously, more competition among writers of curriculum. But it also is creating a more confusing and challenging situation for school districts if there were more than eight different choices that they could have uh, tried out and, and, and chose three to, to pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, it's a new and messier process, yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering, um, so I guess there were 63% of teachers who were using everyday math um, primarily, but then there was a whole bunch of different resources that they were also supplementing mm -hmm. with. So it already seems like there's kind of a individualization, customization yeah. uh, by teachers based on what they think is effective or um, based on what they want to use and yeah. have found as being effective with their students. Yeah, and it sounds like that also, mm -hmm. you know, like many other things in Palo Alto, varies great greatly from school, school to school. School to school, exactly. Yeah. And it, it means that the quality of the teacher becomes even more important mm -hmm. than it normally is. And I think that's, you know, when <clears throat> Kevin Skelly, the previous superintendent, was pushing for the 2009 adoption of everyday math, mm -hmm. his big uh, justification was, you know, we hired the best teachers in this district they can teach anything, and it's about the teachers. It's not about the mm -hmm. adopted curricula. And I'm sure to an extent that's true, but I think that there are plenty of parents in this district whose kids have experienced a not-so-great uh -huh. teacher, and I think that that's where they want assurances through a process like this yeah. that we're going to have curriculum that, um, that works right. and that even a mediocre teacher is going to be able to successfully deliver it. Yeah. So it was uh, maybe a little bit confusing uh, on Tuesday night what exactly the result of this discussion mm -hmm. and expression of concern from the school board members was. So, um, so the pilot, so uh, the deadline that they were working towards was that textbooks have to be ordered by July first, mm -hmm. um, and then the pilot was going to roll out this fall. What has changed <laughs> as a result of this discussion? So it sounds like the July first deadline is kind of flexible. They can make it work ordering things later in the year. So. Mm -hmm. And Tuesday was the school board's last meeting of the school year, so that's why they were sort of also up against that. They don't have a meeting in two weeks where they could talk about it again. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not totally pushing reset. They just seem to be slowing it down a little bit. Um, the school board wants to have a study session, a special meeting dedicated to this topic mm -hmm. when they reconvene in August. Mm -hmm. And the new the elementary math committee will also be starting its meetings in August. Um, so they want to devote that time, I think, to getting more community engagement and input, and then would just start a pilot later in the fall. Um, so oh, no one said, let's take a whole other year to explore mm -hmm. a pilot or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, just sort of slow it down a little bit and make sure the parents get in the process as much as they want to be now. Well, what that would consist of is three different curricula being piloted at the same time yeah. across the district. Yeah. So somehow a third of the teachers would be using one program, a third would be using another, and a third... I'm not sure they haven't explained how that would work. Um, that seems also kind of messy. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing seems kind of messy. And, um, and now I guess it's conceivable that they would go back and reassess the selection of those three. So 
there could be a fourth or there could be a replacement of one of these three with yeah. another one. So it's sort of all up in the air, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. Well, thanks for helping us to untangle <laughs> uh, this particular issue. Uh, why don't we turn our attention next to um, Castilea? Mm -hmm. um, now, that school has also been under some scrutiny for a while because of, well, it, it violated its um, enrollment uh, several years back and mm -hmm. had to pay a $300,000 fine. Now it's having um, some formal uh, plans that it's trying to move forward with the city of Palo mm -hmm. Alto. Uh, what happened this week um, with the meeting that they held? So the school held a meeting with um, neighbors who live in the community, which they have, they've had, I think, 25 meetings apparently over the past mm, three years wow. with the, the, the neighbors plus informal meetings. But they wanted to announce that they've filed a conditional use permit, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of launching this official city process to increase their enrollment over the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, they want to get up to 540 students mm -hmm. um, over four years, which is about 100 more students than they have now. Um, they also want to totally rebuild their classroom buildings, mm. um, build an underground parking garage, and do a lot to address neighbors' concerns um, around pa traffic and parking impact in the neighborhood. So it's a pretty big, uh, it's a drastic plan, yeah. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say this, this is an issue basically of um, wanting to expand and grow, but having to deal with lingering distrust. Uh, from some of the neighbors, not all, mm -hmm. um, because of the violation yeah. of the CUP conditional use permit and uh, the traffic mm -hmm. impacts that they've been experiencing over several years. Yeah. So the idea of the um, underground parking garage, is that supposed to take care of anyone who needs to park at Castilea? Uh, it's supposed to accommodate the 540 students, so the entire student body once it's grown, as well as all employees, and they wouldn't be allowed to increase their enrollment until the garage is built. Um, but they did talk about it on Wednesday night, a neighbor asked, well, um, how can you guarantee that you know high schoolers still won't just park on the streets, or if they don't feel like going in the garage, or whatever it is, people will still be parking on the streets um, in front of our houses. And the school said, yeah, we can't really guarantee that, um, but we will have room for everyone who needs to park on site. Yeah. Another aspect of um, Castilea's efforts over the past year has included years um, transportation demand management mm -hmm. program, um, and that seems to be effective. Um, they have what shuttles? And yeah, there's sh shuttles. They have off-site employee parking. They did a lot of incentives to get people to bike to work for mm -hmm. teachers or take public transportation. Um, I know that they've had students work on sort of projects around sustainability and impact in the neighborhood, and sort of take the edu educational aspect to it. Um, yeah. And some neighbors have said it has made a difference. I spoke to one neighbor who lives across the street on Bryan, mm. um, and she said that she really noticed a change and a decrease in parking and traffic since all these efforts have, have been made. Mm -hmm. um, but other neighbors feel like it's not enough, um, and mm -hmm. things are only going to get worse over the next few years just in Palo Alto broadly. In general. Right. Um, and they're also mm -hmm. not willing to sign up for a few years of construction on top of all of that. Sure. Well, I was going to ask you about that. Have, uh, have you seen any of their actual plans for how they will remain operating while under construction and just how that's going to work? Um, they, I don't think they have official plans yet because it's pretty early in the process mm -hmm. or the nothing that they publicly shared. They said that um, the head of school said that she's looked at a similar school in L.A., that did similar construction, and they created she had a really great euphemism for portables, so something like a, a teaching village or something. So they would, <laughs> translation: They would that put portables lovely. on their field, um, and they would do the construction in two phases. So they so they sort of condense on one part of the property yeah. while they did yeah. the construction. Um, but that would be a pretty serious change for students during those years, mm -hmm. and probably eliminate the athletic, the little athletic field they've yeah. got. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and any mention of groundwater and groundwater pumping to go underground with parking. This is in a neighborhood where um, it took a lot of pumping to put in basements for people yeah. like Larry yeah. Page. And, um, um, someone, a, a neighbor asked with concern also about digging because um, they want to lower the center of campus and also lower the pool and about hitting, I mean, I don't really understand groundwater, but yeah. about hitting water. Yeah. Um, they said that they, they're they aware of that, yeah. they're planning for it, and they would also divert some of that water and. Um, use it throughout the neighborhood, apparently. That's part of their plan with uh -huh. the city. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I think one of the tricky things with um, any kind of traffic uh, plan is really the monitoring. I mean, you can say that you're going to monitor it, and uh, I believe in your story uh, you quoted uh, Castilea saying that if there's a violation, we'll do such and such. 
but what exactly is the such and such and 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 how rigorous is the monitoring how do they know yeah. uh, whether or not they're violating it yeah um, they did they want to commit to an, an annual audit of their um, enrollment and um, checkups on the traffic and they mm -hmm. said that they propose various consequences for themselves if they violate these things that are more aggressive than what the city would usually offer, and they're trying to say that they're being very proactive, I think given, you know, obviously the lingering distrust over the fact that they violated their enrollment cap for years without yeah. telling anyone or anyone knowing. Right, right. Um, so they seem to be trying to be proactive about it and assure neighbor, neighbors that that won't happen again. Um, but yeah, some neighbors so. on Wednesday just said, you've used up all our sort of goodwill and mm -hmm. we were not in support of this. Mm -hmm. I know with uh, Stanford's um, GUP, the general use permit for them, they have an annual, they have a biannual spring and, and fall uh, monitoring process where they do an actual count. Mm -hmm. And I, I would imagine that something like that, fall, spring, maybe more frequent, needs to be yeah. implemented in order to rebuild kind of the trust that, yeah. or the lack of trust that yeah. um, neighbors have there. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're filing their CUP pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, June 30th of the month. Yeah. Um, did they have any sense of how long the uh, city's going to take to evaluate all the plans and to discuss the traffic you know, problems? And they said they were told it would be a 12 to 8 month long process. 12 to 18? 18. 18, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they'll have to go to the ARB and the Planning Commission sure. and all of that. So, um, and they wanted to also assure neighbors, you know, this is sort of just the beginning. Yeah. There's going to be public hearings and lots of opportunity for you and others in the city to weigh in on this. Um, mm -hmm. So it's also sort of the broadening of this many, the past few years have just been the sort of smaller subset of the neighbors who live in the immediate area. And I'm sure over the next few months, it's going to broaden as it comes to the city for further discussion. Yeah, we should say too that there are neighbors who are very supportive of the school, its mission, um, who are very excited about the opportunities that that might present to more girls mm -hmm. for education as well. Yeah. Um, you spoke to, a, I believe, a mother of a graduate yes. who was um, pro casty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> naturally. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else about this particular topic that we should note? I don't think so. We'll continue to follow it as it moves forward through this next process. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for the discussion this, uh, today, and um, we'll see what next week holds. Um, you can follow all the news on paloaltaonline.com and comment on these topics on Palo Alto Online uh, slash square, which is Town Square, our community forum. Uh, we'll see you next week.